Tonight, breaking news. The FBI raid at Trump's Mar-a-Lago. The former president confirming a large number of agents swarmed his current home in Palm Beach, Florida. Trump calling it a break-in, what the White House just said and what it could mean to his supporters just months before the midterms. Also, millions of Americans on alert as extreme weather sweeps from coast to coast. The images of packed airports nationwide after severe storms delayed or canceled thousands of flights this weekend. High water rescues in Denver and Death Valley seeing its second wettest day in history. Plus, President Biden touring flood-ravaged eastern Kentucky after nearly 40 people were killed there. But the area could also get hit with another round of heavy rain as those storms march east. The major win for President Biden and Democrats, the Senate narrowly passing a historic bill on climate, health care and taxes. A landmark price tag to fight climate change and how it could affect the cost of your medication. Deadly inferno, a massive fire ripping through an oil plant in Cuba. Other countries now sending teams to help as flames spread to a third tank filled with fuel. And how to hotwire the rash of car thefts in Milwaukee. Thieves stealing cars in just seconds using only a USB cord. The concern, they might be learning how to commit that crime on social media. And remembering Olivia Newton-John, the actress and pop star dying at 73 after a battle with breast cancer, a look back at her incredible career, including that iconic role in Greece. Top Story starts right now. Good evening, I'm Gotti Schwartz, in for Tom Yamas. We begin tonight with breaking news. The FBI has executed a search warrant at the home of former President Trump. Trump confirming the news in a statement saying a large number of agents were raiding Mar-a-Lago in Palm Beach, Florida. He says the raid was unannounced, slamming it as politically motivated and even claiming agents, quote, broke into his safe. It's unclear what they were searching for, but the White House says they were also not informed ahead of time. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins us now. Danny, uh, this is just breaking as we went to air. Uh, what do you make of what we're seeing now? Oh, it's definitely just breaking. I mean, I was called away from dinner just to break, cover this breaking news. And really what we know right now is just that the FBI apparently has executed a search warrant. And all you know about a search warrant is it means that by definition, uh, the FBI went with an affidavit of probable cause to a magistrate, to a judge, uh, and demonstrated that it is more likely than not that there is evidence of a criminal activity that they need to seize at Mar-a-Lago. That's about all you can glean from the fact that a search warrant has issued. It must be based on probable cause. But of what? It's hard to say. You might infer that just a few days ago, on, uh, on or around July 27, uh, uh, the DOJ obtained a search warrant to search the phone of attorney John Eastman, and they've obtained, they've been conducting another, uh, otherwise an investigation into the activities of, uh, of January 6. But again, that's conjecture right now. All we really seem to know is that there apparently is a search warrant being executed or it was executed at Mar-a-Lago. And we've seen uh, that search warrant executed, but we haven't heard yet from the FBI. Do you think that they are going to be addressing this in the short term? Because we, we now have a statement from uh, the former President Trump. If this were the normal case, I would say that do, you should not plan to hear from the FBI or the U.S. attorney uh, for that district because the FBI's usual practice and the federal government's usual practice is not to comment on ongoing investigations. Uh, so that would be my normal answer. But this is not the normal case, and this is not the normal, I don't want to say target yet, but uh, this is not the normal person, uh, that being Donald Trump, to have a search warrant uh, issued for his home. So this might be the unusual case where the FBI does hold a press conference and does offer some information to explain why they're executing a search warrant on a former president of the United States, something that just doesn't happen every day. So unprecedented times may call for a breach of the FBI's normal protocol, which is to never, ever talk about ongoing investigation. And yet we have a, a former president who is quick basically to the presses. I want to read just a little bit uh, from his statement here. Uh, he says, nothing like this has ever happened to a president of the United States before. After working and cooperating with the relevant government agencies, this unannounced raid on my home was not necessary or appropriate. It is prosecu prosecutorial misconduct. 
the weaponization of the justice system. And then Danny, a little bit further down, he, he says, they even broke into my safe, a safe exclamation point. So we know uh, that they went into his home. They know that the, we know that they were unannounced. We know that uh, they were looking for things in his safe. Do we know any specifics on, on what they could have been looking for? No, but just to give you an idea, if there were search warrants issued for folks like John Eastman, the Trump uh, affiliated lawyer who pushed some of these uh, election fraud theories, then it's not a huge leap to say that Trump's uh, Mar-a-Lago might contain evidence of information related to, say, for example, the evidence that they sought in John Eastman's cell phone or some of these other folks that the DOJ is investigating. That is a rather innocuous interpretation. Of course, uh, another interpretation is simply that the FBI believes that it is more likely than not that there is evidence that, uh, that uh, Trump or somebody else close to Trump committed a crime or that they have evidence of that crime at Mar-a-Lago. That could be cell phones, uh, that could be documents, that could be virtually anything. So it's really hard to say at this point. And the FBI, when they get a search warrant like this, they make it as broad as they possibly can. So no surprise that they uh, got a hold of a safe. Uh, a safe is something that might contain evidence that is relevant to their, uh, their investigation. So that's entirely possible. But, you know, these search warrants, they take a while to execute. The FBI goes through all things physical, and digital. They catalog everything. They take a lot of photographs. This is not something that happens quickly. It is a long process, a very invasive process. Uh, so Trump is probably right. I wouldn't have any reason to disbelieve him that they went into a safe if he had one on the premises. So uh, again, we don't know exactly what it's for, but given the flurry of activity uh, around January 6th, the committee, which is starting back up in September, it could be related to that. It could be related to something that we had no idea about up until now. And Danny, the Justice Department is supposed to be nonpartisan. The FBI is supposed to rise above partisan politics. And yet in this statement, we here have President Trump or former President Trump saying Democrats broke into the home of the 45th president of the United States. How much is politics going to play into this before the midterms elections? Yeah, well, the Democrats didn't break into his home. It's the FBI executing a search warrant. So words do matter. I mean, I understand uh, I understand not being happy about the FBI executing search warrant on one's own, whether you're the former president or just somebody that nobody's ever heard of. It is not a pleasant process. But look, everything about any investigation of Trump is going to be inherently political. No matter what happens, uh, Trump and his circle can claim that it is a political prosecution. And uh, the challenge for the DOJ and Merrick Garland is the fact that, yes, midterms are coming up very soon. Uh, and then shortly after that, in within a couple of years, another presidential election in which it's very likely that President Trump could be the nominee and running for president again. So Merrick Garland and the DOJ have a really difficult position to be in, which is at what time, if you believe there's probable cause that a former president committed a crime, how do you proceed and have it not be accused of being a political prosecution? This is an unenviable position for Merrick Garland, a difficult one. And that's why I suspect you're seeing a lot of uh, silence from the DOJ on this issue, because they're grappling with timing just like anyone else would. And in the past, when you see something, nothing like this has ever happened, but in the past, a lot of the, uh, the accusations of politics come from a team of lawyers, maybe a week, two weeks, three weeks into an investigation. Here we have it uh, literally minutes after the raid coming from the former president of the United States. How do they walk that tightrope with uh, making sure that trust in the judicial system and trust in the Justice Department is still maintained? Complaining that the federal government is engaged in a witch hunt is actually not a new thing to do. White collar defendants do it all the time. And that's because a lot of white collar crimes, uh, the defendants often believe that what they did was perfectly lawful. And you see a lot of these similarities in President Trump. He believes that what he has done uh, has been lawful at all times. And he finds that the federal government investigating him is nothing more than a witch hunt. The, the federal prisons are full of white collar defendants who believe that uh, they were the victims of a witch hunt. So this kind of narrative is nothing new. If I were Trump's defense attorneys, or I, if Trump ends up needing defense attorneys, I should say, 
Uh, I would uh, not be happy that the client is putting out uh, uh, press releases like this, but uh, it's President Trump. I mean, former President Trump, he believes that he can talk his way through this issue. Uh, he's had a lot of success doing it in the past. Uh, if nothing else, he's going to claim and apparently has claimed in his statement uh, something to the effect of, look, they've investigated me for a long time. They've never brought anything. Uh, and now this is more of a witch hunt. This is more of the same narrative. And Merrick Garland has to realize that if he's going to execute a search warrant, he can't do it willy nilly. He's got to really believe that there is evidence of a crime on that property to execute a search warrant. And that is the real takeaway here, that Merrick Garland uh, knows that if he's going to make a move in this game of political chess, uh, that he has to make it only when he's certain. So I would suspect that uh, the FBI is more than probable cause. They probably have a lot more evidence than probable cause because Merrick Garland and the FBI would accept nothing less to execute a search warrant on Mar-a-Lago. It is a very, very significant development and one that the FBI certainly didn't do lightly. Danny, we can't thank you enough for that instant analysis. We're also following severe weather from coast to coast. New video shows firefighters rescuing children trapped in a car in Denver after flash flooding. In California, cars buried and almost 1,000 people stranded in Death Valley National Park after nearly a year's worth of rain fell in just a single day. The severe storms creating another travel nightmare. Thousands of flights canceled or delayed nationwide this weekend. And today, President Biden visiting eastern Kentucky after flooding wiped out neighborhoods and left nearly 40 people dead. All of this as parts of the country are still facing relentless heat. Here's NBC's Ann Thompson. Late summer is traditionally flash flood season, but 2022's events are increasingly record setters. Climate change is making it easier for the heaviest rains to, to become even heavier. And this summer is a good example of that trend which has been playing out over decades. More rain in a shorter time. Parts of Denver got more than two inches Sunday, much of it coming in just an hour. Swamping streets, firefighters rescuing 29 people from their vehicles, including these children. This is what happens when the hottest place on earth suddenly becomes one of the wettest. Death Valley National Park still cleaning up after Friday's devastating flood. Nearly an inch and a half of rain fell in the California desert, the most ever in a single August day. The park is closed. Feet of mud and rocks in many areas across park roads. Other areas have stretches of the road that are completely gone and will need to be rebuilt. In South Dakota, Sioux Falls recorded its wettest day ever, getting more than five inches on Sunday. The warmer the air, the more moisture it can hold. 90% of 150 locations surveyed by Climate Central now get more average rainfall an hour compared to 1970. Rainfall intensity increasing 13%. The storm's wreaking havoc with an already stressed airline system. Today, cancellations more than 600, delays over 4,000. They just kept saying weather, 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 weather. As America copes with a summer of uncertain skies. Ann Thompson, NBC News. And as we cover all that severe weather this summer today, President Biden visiting hard hit eastern Kentucky, where new flash flood alerts have been issued in an area still recovering from a disaster that killed at least 37 people. Our Kathy Park is there. Tonight, the historic floodwaters have receded in eastern Kentucky, revealing a muddy mess and a total loss for so many families. We're in survival mode, obviously. The support makes it all doable. Riverside Christian School in Lost Creek entering the second week of cleanup. There was so much mud. We had to clear this hallway before we could even get this door open. As they scramble for the first day of classes. Every building on our campus had some form of water in it except one. Um, most of our buildings were a total loss. President Biden and the First Lady saw the devastation firsthand, promising federal help. It's going to take a while to get through this, but I promise you we're not leaving. Federal government, all its resources, as long as it takes, we're going to be here. At least 37 people have died, with two still unaccounted for. The damage expanding across 13 counties. In hard hit Breathitt, the poverty rate is more than double the national average. This is the most devastating and deadly flooding event, certainly in my lifetime, unlike anything we have ever seen. 
Experts say the region is vulnerable to more devastation from natural disasters, pointing to abandoned coal mines that have forever changed the landscape and historically poor oversight in the industry. Thank you. Tonight, the goodness of strangers and faith rising above the waters. It was strong enough to rip homes off their foundations, strong enough to rip trees out of the ground, but the Lord works through devastation and through tragedy to bring our community together. And Kathy Park joins us now from Lost Creek, Kentucky. Kathy, are officials there concerned about any severe weather that might threaten recovery efforts this week? Well, Gotti adding insult to injury, the threat for more severe weather is in the forecast through Thursday. And officials fear that even an inch or even two inches of rain could further complicate the cleanup and recovery efforts. And as you can see behind me, there is a big cleanup ahead here. Gotti. Kathy, thank you. With more rain and potential flooding in the forecast for that area, let's get right to meteorologist Bill Karens to walk us through what the next few days could look like. Bill? And Gotti, we have to remember, why do we care so much about flash flooding? Flash flooding kills more people every year in our country than tornadoes and hurricanes or any other weather phenomenon. So uh, that's why you know, we pay so much attention to it. We try to tell people, if you see high water, do not drive through it. That's how a lot of people get trapped because they can't see that the road is washed away. So on the maps, there's nothing that's really ominous right now in Kentucky. That's good. It's tomorrow that Kentucky has it a little bit worse. There are some pretty good thunderstorms south of St. Louis, some really heavy rain right along the Mississippi River there in between Illinois, Missouri, and right down south to Paducah. So maybe some isolated flash flooding there. But tomorrow is really the day that I'm worried about. From Lexington to Nashville to Knoxville, tomorrow we're in a slight risk of sort of flash flooding. So there's slight risk, then there's moderate, then there's high. When we had our historic event, we were in a moderate to high risk. So it's not a situation that we expect to be like that. But regardless, we could pick up another one to two inches of rainfall. And if we get the training of those thunderstorms, that's where it could be a little bit worse. And as far as the heat goes, one more day. We can, we can do it. We can do one more day in the Northeast, and then things will turn the corner. The heat's broke a little bit in a few areas there, especially in the Southern Plains. You notice the current temperatures, it's still in the upper 80s from New York to D.C., and it looks like Dallas 101 today. You did break your 100-degree streak yesterday, and it's not just that it's hot. It's that it's so humid. It still feels like 101 feels like temperature right now in Philadelphia. But the relief is on the way. We've been waiting for this Canadian cold front. So tomorrow is it. And then we'll see the temperatures begin to drop in the northeast. So, uh, yeah, one more day, Gotti. We can do it. The cooling trend is on the way. Thanks so much, Bill. To New Mexico now, where officials are searching for a possible serial killer who may be responsible for the deaths of four Muslim men in Albuquerque. NBC's Guad Venegas has more. Tonight, a terrified Muslim community in Albuquerque on edge after the killings of four Muslim men, authorities calling their shooting deaths targeted. There are several things in common with all four of the homicides, and we're digging back and looking at any other crime that might fit this, a similar pattern. Police say the latest victim, 25-year-old Naim Hussein, was found dead Friday night from a gunshot wound outside the Lutheran Family Services, known for providing services for refugees. Just days ago, Hussein attended the funerals of two of the other Albuquerque murder victims, Muhammad Asfal Hussein and Aftab Hussein, all three originally from Pakistan. The president of the Islamic Center of New Mexico hoping investigators comb all possible links. Their community is, um, you know, it's very deflated and uh, eagerly awaiting some response, some answer to why. All four men targeted in public areas of this section in Albuquerque. The FBI is now involved. Authorities now desperately searching for this vehicle they say may be tied to all four killings. They feel a sense of helplessness. They're in fear. Uh, their whole world has been flipped upside down. MTS Hussein's brother, Muhammad Afsal Hussein, was one of the victims. My kids, they are very scared because the incident happened just in the same block. They don't let me go out in the balcony. And Guad joins us now from New Mexico. Guad, authorities are asking for help from the community. Are they offering any kind of reward? Uh, Gotti, they are. They've asked the community to submit videos and also photos that might help them. And also they want this information that could help them arrest and convict those responsible. The award at this time has increased to $30,000 for any information that could lead to that arrest and conviction. Meanwhile, they did tell me this morning that they've already received some clues and they're following up on that information as they continue with that investigation, Gotti.
Lockwood, thank you. Heading now to Washington, where Democrats are celebrating a major win after a sweeping bill passed the Senate. The so-called Inflation Reduction Act includes top climate, health, and tax initiatives for Democrats and now heads over to the House. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale has the latest. <laughs> Tonight, Democrats victorious, if a little weary, after a marathon weekend. It was a long night, it was a long month, it was a long year, but we got it done. A nearly 22-hour Senate session that culminated in the passage of a sweeping health care, climate, and economic bill. $430 billion in spending with unprecedented climate and energy investments. I have never seen or anticipated anything as significant as this piece of legislation. Electric vehicle incentives, methane reduction programs, and clean energy jobs. Plus, lower drug costs for seniors, with Medicare now able to directly negotiate with pharmaceutical companies. What does that mean to you? It means a lot. It, uh, my anxiety will go down. Hopefully, that will keep a roof over my head and food in my refrigerator for a longer period of time. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. It means my life, really. To pay for it, Democrats targeting tax changes aimed at the wealthiest and big corporations, hiking the corporate minimum tax rate to 15% for big businesses, and boosting IRS enforcement. The bill bears the policy imprint of moderate Democrats Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, who downsized the package over the course of the last year of negotiating with Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Schumer, though, celebrating the political balancing act. So this is my secret uh, to success. Some Democrats still mad about what was left out. The bottom line is this legislation is a baby step forward. It doesn't go as far as it should. But President Biden calling it a win. Do I expect you to help? Yes, I do. It's going to need you to help. The megawatt deal now a centerpiece of the midterm message for both parties. We voted. Democrats delivered. This is a terrible bill. They're increasing spending and they're raising taxes while we're in the middle of a recession. NBC News correspondent Ali Vitale joins us now from Capitol Hill. Ali, what's the timeline looking like for getting this bill through the House? Well, look, the Senate is now out of town, and it's the House's turn to come back in town. They're coming back Friday from their recess. They're going to do their work on this. We're not expecting any hiccups in their process, Gotti. Most parts of the Democratic Party there are already on board for what's in this legislation. So consider it on a glide path. Once it hits the House on Friday, it then goes immediately to President Biden's desk, and you know he is eager to sign it. Uh, and, Ali, while I've got you, and now I'm wondering whether this is going to go through <laughs> first or whether we're going to see electable. Uh, finally get released. I mean, how many more days do I have to wait? You are on my waiting list on, <laughs> on Audible here, and I, I can't wait to read your book. I am in a horse race with reconciliation, Gotti. I didn't even think of it that way. But no, the book comes out on August 23rd. I have a feeling the bill will be done before that. But nevertheless, I am very eager for you to get your copy. Thank you so much. <laughs> Allie, thank you. For more on the impact of this bill, I want to bring in CNBC senior analyst Ron Insana. Ron, let's just get started with the title. This is called sure. the Inflation Reduction Act. Is this bill actually going to slow down inflation? Well, I don't think, Gotti, that it's ex aimed exactly at that. I mean, I think it, it, it's, it's an overstatement to suggest that in the near term, any of these items would bring down inflation per se uh, in the immediate future. I mean, certainly lowering the cost of prescription drugs. And, and, and quite frankly, it's tragic that the insulin cost didn't go from $1,200 a month to 35. That would have been an immediate hit to, for many uh, diabetics who are overpaying for insulin at the moment. But um, some of this will help uh, in terms of drug price reform, but that's going to take place over the course of the next four years. It currently only applies to 10 drugs. The ACA subsidies will help uh, because it will make health care more affordable for seniors. Uh, and, and, and climate and energy investments certainly over the long run can help reduce, uh, number one, our dependence on more expensive and more volatile fossil fuels, and to bring down the cost of clean energy over the course of time. But you're not going to see an impact on inflation tomorrow. What's, what's going to impact that more will be Federal Reserve interest rates and a potential slowing in the economy. And Ron, Democrats are going to be seeing this and the headlines that follow as this big win ahead of the midterms. But how long will it take for people to actually start uh, feeling some of the benefits in their pocketbooks? Well, I, it's not really a pocketbook issue. I mean, again, these, the, the tax increases, which I think the Republicans are vastly overstating their impact on the economy, $700 billion over 10 years is $70 billion a year in a $20 trillion economy. It's like finding a penny in the couch. It's really not that big of a deal as far as the economic impact is concerned. Some of these more targeted items, again, having to do with Medicare and the ACA, uh, people will feel more immediately. And then a clean energy jobs, 
as they continue to get rolled out will certainly help over time the employment situation where very high paying jobs in those industries will become more and more available. And Ron, some critics are, are pointing to the corporate minimum tax and saying that this is actually going to cause some companies to consider layoffs and, and other money saving measures. Uh, do you think that's a, a possibility? No. <laughs> it's just it's political posturing. It's nonsense. I mean, this really, at the end of the day, they're going to be offsets within this that they'll still find loopholes to get around some of it. Uh, the revenue raisers are not that substantial. And, and, and from a, a the perspective of corporate profits, they're really more dependent on economic activity. They're more dependent on growth. They're more dependent on the success of their products and their investments than they are going to be hampered by a 1% you know, stock buyback tax or even the minimum tax, which uh, they have successfully avoided in many cases for for quite a number of years. And Ron, I definitely want to get your take on, on this new uh, New York Fed survey uh, that found that Consumers in July expected inflation to drop off significantly next year, down to 6.2 percent, then down to 3.2 percent in three years. Uh, how important is that apparent boost in consumer confidence, and, and what bearing does it actually have on, on the reality that we're seeing today? Well, one of the biggest things that the Federal Reserve worries about is an entrenched notion that inflation is here to stay, which alters consumer behavior rather radically, substituting chicken for steak and, and, and things like that, Create, changing their behavior, spending less because they think inflation won't go down. It's a pretty big deal that they're looking at a rapid drop off in inflation, and they're seeing evidence of that. You know, the price of gasoline has fallen, I believe, now for 54 straight days. It's down 90 cents a gallon. Oil prices have fallen $40 a barrel. You're seeing commodity prices ease. You're seeing the price of consumer goods fall again. And so I think that just reinforces the notion that, number one, the Fed may have already done enough uh, to help bring down inflation. Two, supply chains are beginning to return to normal. And three, products are becoming more and more available. So I think it's a good sign that the consumer is saying this versus almost anybody else, because they're the ones who are feeling the pinch at the gas pump, at the grocery store, and elsewhere in their personal lives. Ron, thank you so much. Heading now overseas in the war in Ukraine, President Zelensky calling for a strong international response to what he calls Russian nuclear terror after several recent attacks on the largest nuclear power station in Europe. NBC's Morgan Chesky is in central Ukraine with the latest. Tonight, damage to Ukraine's largest nuclear power plant, raising red flags worldwide. The weakened rocket attack destroying high-voltage wires at the Russian-controlled plant, forcing Ukrainian workers to limit output for one of the six massive reactors. One employee struck by shrapnel as explosions rang out. Ukraine says Russia is using the Zaporizhia plant, nearly twice the size of Chernobyl, as cover, allowing Russia to shell cities without fear of being fired on. Ukraine's president calling the attack terrorism. Ukraine and Russia accused each other of shelling the plant. Russia releasing this video, claiming to show damage inflicted by Ukrainian forces. The United Nations nuclear watchdog saying every principle of nuclear safety has been violated. What we have in Saporizhia, what we have in Ukraine, the situation is really, really uh, a volatile one. As Ukraine prepares to retake territory in its shell-stricken south, volunteers nationwide helping equip soldiers. In Poltava, teams weave special camouflage for Ukrainian snipers on the front lines. The city now shelters more than 50,000 refugees. Nina Voitova and her daughter Vika fled Kharkiv in March. Their apartment shelled. Vika's school nearly destroyed. So Nina's telling me it wasn't until after they left Kharkiv they realized how close they came. And look at this. Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven holes from either bullets or shrapnel. The whole family inside this car, somehow nobody was hurt. With her third child due in just one week, Nina's doing her best to keep her daughter's dream alive. Dancing her way to victory in competitions and hopefully a brighter future. This mother and daughter, just two of the 12 million people who have fled their homes in a war that rages on. And tonight, Ukrainian officials say it appears that all of the reactors are still operational, but they did share an ominous warning from the Russian military leader currently in control of that nuclear plant, who said that they had mined critical facilities inside and that the land would remain Russia's or no one's. Gotti?
Morgan, thank you. Meanwhile, in Russia, basketball star Brittany Griner is still behind bars, but she's not the only American prisoner detained in the country. Advocates are pushing for several other detainees to be recognized and freed, while officials say a deal for Griner to come home might be possible. Kindalanian has more. Tonight, new hope for WNBA star Brittany Griner after Russia said it was ready to discuss a prisoner swap with the U.S. My view is that I'm optimistic. I think she's going to be freed. I think she has the right strategy of contrition, a good legal team. Um, there's going to be a prisoner swap, though, and I think it'll be two for two. Former U.N. Ambassador Bill Richardson telling ABC on Sunday that he believes the basketball star and another prisoner, former Marine Paul Whelan, will be freed in exchange for two Russians in U.S. custody. We have to bring American hostages home, especially those wrongfully detained, especially those that have served in our military. The price expected to include the release of Russian's arms trafficker Victor Boot, sentenced to 25 years in 2012 for selling weapons to Colombian rebels. Last week, Reiner was sentenced to nine years in prison for bringing cannabis oil into the country, pleading with a Russian judge in court. I made an honest mistake, and I hope that in your ruling, that it doesn't end my life here. Public pressure increased after the ruling for President Joe Biden to bring her home. Bring Brittany home! Though also putting a spotlight on other Americans detained, like Waylon, a former Marine, who is three years into a 16-year sentence on espionage charges that he and the U.S. deny. And Mark Fogel, a teacher arrested in 2021 for trying to enter the country with half an ounce of medical marijuana that he'd been prescribed in the U.S. for chronic pain. Fogel received a 14-year sentence in June for drug smuggling. Last month, the White House press secretary was asked why Fogel wasn't included in the prisoner swap. There are certain cases that we cannot speak to because of privacy uh, issues, and that is one of them that we cannot actually uh, speak to. News of another case, Sarah Krivenek, an American in Russia, also detained following a domestic dispute. This according to her friend, Anita Martinez. I knew about the domestic violence. I knew what had, what had happened to her, and um, I knew that she was trying to get out. I knew that, um, you know, she, the embassy was helping her to get out. And um, she called me and that's when she sent me, you know, those videos and then the last uh, voicemail um, that she sent me. So I was actually on video call with her when she was arrested. So I saw them take her. Martinez saying Krivenek tried to leave Russia ahead of her trial, but was taken into custody. She shared the last voicemails Krivenek left her. Now if I have to go away, I'm going to go to prison, in Russian prison, because a person beat me up really bad and I scratched him in his nose with a knife. And there is no way to protect yourself here because there is different rules. So if I don't, if you don't ever hear from me, me again, I love you and you're my dear friend, dear friend, never go away from me. Just so I think about my faith. I'm so sorry. And Ken Delanian joins us now from Washington. Ken, what are the factors that the Biden administration is thinking about as they uh, contemplate this prisoner swap? And, and are there any voices inside the government who are arguing against this? There absolutely are officials, for example, at the Justice Department, Gotti, who are very concerned about these potential prisoner swaps because the United States inevitably gives up a lot. Victor Boot, for example, is somebody the U.S. government pursued for years, and American officials say he was responsible for a lot of human misery by selling illicit arms and conflicts all over the developing world. There are also reports Russia may ask for a convicted murderer in this trade. These are people the U.S. does not want to set free. And some officials also worry that doing these trades incentivizes Russia or other adversaries to simply grab more Americans. But at the end of the day, Gotti, the U.S. government is always going to be under enormous pressure to do whatever it can to free Americans held hostage. Unfortunately, our adversaries know that. Got it. Back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the urgent search for a missing teenager in California. Police say 16 year old Kylie Rodney was last seen leaving a big party at a campground near Tahoe National Forest early Saturday morning. Authorities are now investigating her disappearance as an abduction because of her car, a silver Honda CRV that they say is also missing. 
Next to the multi-million dollar smash and grab caught on camera in New York City, surveillance video shows a group of thieves breaking display cases with hammers and then stuffing duffel bags with high value diamonds. The store says they made off with more than $2 million in jewels in just 30 seconds. It happened in the middle of the afternoon after one suspect buzzed into the store and once the door was open, the others ran in. The family of Gabby Petito has filed a $50 million lawsuit against police in Utah. Body cam footage shows a visibly upset Petito and Brian Laundry talking to police in Moab after they got into an argument shortly before their death. Her family is now accusing the department of failing to properly investigate Petito's domestic violence case and protect her. Laundry admitted to killing Petito in a journal found after both of their deaths. And Aston Kutcher says he's, quote, lucky to be alive while revealing a health battle. In a new TV clip, the 44-year-old actor says he lost his ability to see, to hear, and to walk about two years ago while suffering from a rare form of the autoimmune disorder, vasculitis. Kutcher says it took about a year for his senses to recover, but now he's just grateful to be alive. And we continue our breaking news coverage of that FBI raid at Mar-a-Lago, the current home of former President Trump. The White House just releasing a statement saying that they were not given advance notice of the raid. Let's bring in former federal prosecutor and MSNBC legal analyst Glenn Kirshner. Uh, Glenn, what was the FBI uh, needing to get to have a search warrant of this magnitude to go into Mar-a-Lago? Sure. This is really a, a pretty enormous step, a historic step. I would call it a legal barrier being broken, kind of a maiden legal voyage, because what DOJ decided to do with respect to a former president of the United States is go to a federal court and uh, apply for a search warrant for the de facto home, Mar-a-Lago, of a former president of the United States. What they would have needed to show is that they had evidence that satisfied the burden of probable cause to believe there was evidence of crime right now in the place to be searched. That's the requirement under the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. And a federal judge reviewed a sworn affidavit from FBI agents and concluded that, yes, right now, located at Mar-a-Lago, is evidence of federal crime. Crimes. That's dramatic. So, and I don't think this is just about perhaps some records that were taken unlawfully down to Mar-a-Lago. It it could be that that was the basis for the search warrant, but it has the feel of being something much bigger than that, um, because we know that they were negotiating over the return of these records for a very long time. That kind of informs me as a former career prosecutor that it is probably something bigger and and something other than just an unlawful retention of records. And you got to imagine that prosecutors and the FBI agents doing the raid must have anticipated that there would be a response from the former president pretty immediately. And that's exactly what we saw. We saw the former president calling this a break in, saying that Democrats were basically breaking into his house as a former prosecutor. How do you how do you build a case with that much uh, political uh, uncertainty being pulled into the fray? You build it one piece of evidence at a time. You know, we're never dissuaded by how the people we are indicting and prosecuting react to the fact that we've brought criminal charges against them. You know, I always knew when I made a prosecutorial decision, I was likely to make someone unhappy. If I decided to bring a charge, I would make the defendant and his friends, family and associates unhappy. If I declined to bring a charge, I might make the victim their family, friends, and associates unhappy. That I found very liberating because I could focus solely on the facts that supported either bringing a charge or declining to bring a charge. And that is what I believe the federal prosecutors have done here. And, and Glenn, in this particular case, uh, 
we're talking about an entire country uh, that many of them voted in the last election. And so they, they have almost skin in the game here. Uh, I want to bring in uh, Vaughn Hilliard. Glenn, if you can stay with us uh, to talk about what this is going to mean, what this signals uh, to people that may have voted for Trump. Uh, Vaughn, you've been working uh, the, the campaign trail all the way through the midterms in the last election. And, and so much of your work is, is centered around uh, talking to Trump supporters about how they they see uh, the entire country. What do you think that this message or what do you think uh, that today's events are going to uh, to elicit within Trump supporters? Right. I think it's uh, to your question, Gotti. I think that's exactly why we're standing here in Wisconsin. They have a major primary tomorrow. And Trump was here over the weekend. He held a campaign rally for a gubernatorial candidate, somebody who is an election skeptic, who has not said whether he would have certified the 2020 election or not here. Uh, he's also trying to oust Robin Voss, who is the state assembly speaker who refused to decertify the 2020 election here. This is as much a, a, of a political weapon for Donald Trump uh, as it is an all-important, serious investigative matter here. Donald Trump has made himself a martyr to millions of Americans. I, I should note that I was just told by a source familiar that Trump is in New York City at the moment, and he has not been staying at Mar-a-Lago over the course of the summer. He and his family have been residing in Bedminster, which is his golf club in New Jersey. I do not have specifics as to what led him to New York City, today here. But of course, he still works and sometimes lives out of Trump Tower there in New York City. But I think it's important to understand over the last six years, Gotti, you, you have been at your fair share of rallies yourself here, that this is a, 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 a political leader who has made himself a political martyr. Uh, he has called into question uh, the uh, news. He has called into question the so-called deep state. Uh, he has put deep skepticism in the FBA, the Department of Justice, the CIA. He has shared skepticism and called out the elections in America. And there are millions of people, and I know this for a fact, because we have traveled around this country and had conversation after conversation with folks who do not trust the American government as it stands right now here. And you saw just last week in some major primaries in neighboring Michigan, but also in Arizona, uh, the voting of these Trump-backed candidates for Secretary of State, Governor, U.S. Senate, Attorneys General. And why is that? It's because Donald Trump is still viewed as the leader of one of uh, um, America's two major political parties here. There is a lot, not only, uh, you know, potential uh, for, uh, you know, investigatory sake on the line, but also political here. And again, I've got to, I think we need to also to reiterate, we still do not know if Donald Trump himself is the subject of this investigation or what uh, these agents were exactly looking for in Mar-a-Lago at this time. And Vaughn, you make such a, a fascinating point. I mean, we've seen it time and time again, uh, politics at play and former president Donald Trump uh, making himself that political martyr. Glenn, I got to ask if you have uh, the subject of an investigation like this, bringing politics in it at every turn, how do investigators and how to prosecutors rise above that politics or is that impossible? Mm -hmm. It's not impossible. We, we have to tune it out. We can't make prosecutorial decisions based on politics or based on how people might react to our decision to bring I charges. Do. Here I've is what I think is going to be key moving, move, moving forward, though. I think there's going to be a need for transparency. Now that there's been a search warrant executed on the home of a former president, I think there's going to need to be transparency from the Department of Justice so they can begin to show the American people the evidence that supports these law enforcement decisions. Uh, transparency, but possibly expedited transparency, because the speed in which we are seeing responses uh, from former President Trump are, are going to be very fast here. So usually we see the FBI and the Justice Department take their time in presenting that case and building that case and then informing the public. Could we see an expedited timeline here? Expedited transparency, I think, is a great way to put it. It wouldn't surprise me. Now, we certainly can't conclude this will happen. It wouldn't surprise me if we saw what we call a speaking indictment in fairly short order. Think back to the Mueller investigation. Every time those indictments came out, we would learn a whole lot about the evidence supporting the cases that were being, being brought by Mueller. I am hopeful that we begin to see some speaking indictments delivered by the grand jury, by the federal prosecutors that begin to show the American people 
the kind of evidence that supports taking these law enforcement steps. Glenn, thank you so much for joining us. Now to Top Stories Global Watch, we begin in Cuba, where a deadly fire is spreading at a large oil facility. Firefighters say flames have now spread to a third tank. At least one person is dead and more than 125 others were hurt. Officials say the blaze started on Friday after a lightning strike with several explosions reported after. Mexico and Venezuela are also sending special teams to help put out that fire, which could take days. Now to a massive boat fire off the coast of Japan. Footage from above shows the boat engulfed in flames near Tokyo. Five people were on board when the fire broke out. They managed to jump into the water wearing life jackets and were eventually saved. Fortunately, no one was seriously hurt. The cause is still under investigation. And Queen Elizabeth is skipping another public event amid health concerns. The Queen will not be attending the annual welcome ceremony that kicks off her summer vacation at her Scottish castle. Instead, she'll arrive privately due to, quote, reasons of comfort. And we're back tonight with a passing to note. Actress and pop star Olivia Newton-John has died at age 73 after a battle with breast cancer. She would skyrocket to fame with her role as Sandy in that hit movie Grease alongside John Travolta. In the early 80s, her steamy song Physical topped the charts for 10 consecutive weeks. She was first diagnosed with breast cancer in 1992 and it would later return in 2017. In a statement, her family says she passed away peacefully at her home in Southern California, surrounded by loved ones. And when we come back, the breaking news on President Trump and the FBI raid. Finally tonight, that FBI raid at the home of former President Trump. So far, we know a large number of FBI agents executed a search warrant at Mar-a-Lago in Palm Beach, Florida. Trump says the raid was not announced. He called it a break-in that was politically motivating, uh, motivated, adding, quote, nothing like this has ever happened to a president of the United States before. The White House says they were also unaware of the raid ahead of time. We're going to have much more on this developing story across all NBC News platforms. For now, thanks so much for joining us at Top Story. For Tom Yamas, I'm Gotti Schwartz in New York. Stay right there. More news is on the way.